back at you. Let me jump in here again, a little technical thing, but here we are. My name's Austin. This is Flashpoint. Your turnaround story starts here. And if you're watching this, know that this show is being streamed on Apple TV, Amazon Fire, Roku, as well as all the social media platforms. So if you're listening to this, I want you to strap in. <laughs> I'm over the moon, around the earth, excited for this interview. And in a few moments, I'm going to be joined by Andrew Allen, former NASA astronaut. But before I do, I want to give you some context. So I want you to stay with me for this beginning because the resume is so long, but I want to hit at least the highlights so you can get a feel of who we're about to speak with. So I'm excited because Andrew is actually from my area, the greater Philadelphia area. We went to Villanova University. We're going to learn a little bit about that. He then was commissioned by the Marines to be an aviator. I was excited about that because my dad is a former Marine. And you don't often hear about that road where someone goes into the Marines, become an aviator. You normally hear Navy or Air Force. But what a great move this proved to be because he logged over 6,000 flight hours, graduated from Top Gun, as well as the test pilot school. Now, if I stopped right there, I already probably have your attention. You're already eager, like, wow, I want to hear. This sounds exciting. But there was more to the story, and this work gets incredibly compelling. NASA opened up their application process, and Andrew was, I don't know if he was first in line, but he definitely put his application in, and through an incredible series of circumstances, which we are going to learn about, he was selected into NASA's program. But I want to share a little bit more. <laughs> He's also a very successful entrepreneur. He's been at the helm of his own company for over 15 years with Aerodyne Industries. But lastly, He's an incredible family guy. So please help me welcome Andrew Allen, former NASA astronaut, three-time space flight veteran, and incredible family guy, Andrew Allen. Hi, Austin. We made it. How are you? I'm good. How are you today? Excellent. I, I want to take a moment and just thank you for taking this interview because I know that we did a lot of prep for this, and you've been on thousands of interviews. <laughs> so I, I really honor the fact that you you did this and decided to do this. And we'll get more into how this happened a little bit later. But I, yeah, I just want to welcome you to the program. And how how are you doing down there in Florida? I'm doing great down here. It's a nice uh, warm day. I was uh, out flying a little bit this morning. Uh, took a flight back from from Alabama, flying my own little airplane. It was a beautiful day to fly. And Life is good. Life is good. And we were talking before, that's kind of your happy place, you said. Yeah, I've got a few of them, and that's one of my happy places. Yeah. yeah. I'm, we, got a full, we got a good amount of time here, and I, I really wanted to dive into your story as we talked about preparing for this. And I want to give people – I like to go back and really define those defining moments because I think – and this came up a little bit before – is that people look at you and they think, oh, it's – you know, perfect situation, you know, all the right things. And it just happened to tee up for you, but it's not always that way, is it? No, it's not. Um, you know, I'll go back to, you know, even watching some of the things that I grew up with and being a son of a, a World War II veteran, you know, one of the things you, you really learn if you think about that generation or, or listen to what some of the generation does and whether it be a quote from Admiral Halsey or, or whomever, but, but, you know, there are no extraordinary men, really. There's just ordinary people that are either thrown into an extraordinary circumstance or get the opportunity to do extraordinary deeds. But that generation just kind of was an epitome, not that it has been lost on any of the current generation, especially in the war times, because they're just as brave and courageous and dutiful as anybody else. But the things you remember is, you know, uncommon valor being a common virtue. So, so I think and, and with, with the astronaut office, I, I think the thing that we key up is it, it's really everybody is about the same. Everybody kind of has got that same grasp of, of abilities. And it's how you use those abilities. We all have different interests. We all have different strengths. And we all have weaknesses, no matter what. Yes. It's just how you want to address with those and, and do what's right and do what's best. And most importantly, do it well. I really like that you said that because it kind of brings things down to earth. You know, uh, 
because a lot of times we think that someone's so far above us, but it's really that there's, there is an equality there. And if we just tap into our, our gifts, that great things can happen. And I believe that's exactly what happened to you. And I, I want to go back to some of those earlier days. Where <clears throat> maybe there's a, a defining moment. And my, actually, my first question is, was there earlier moment or when was the early moment where you thought maybe that's a possibility for me? Because I think some people think that it's always you want to be an astronaut, but I would like to go back maybe to an early spot where you thought maybe this is something I want to consider. Okay. So, so aviation was always something that I was very interested in since, <clears throat> since I was probably old enough to walk and talk. And my father was an aviator. And, and uh, I think he took all of the, the five kids up in the airplane here or there, but, but it really hit me. And it really was something that struck me. Uh, what, a, what a great opportunity to learn how to fly and, and be an aviator. But you know, probably one of those moments that you think about as you think about your life, especially when you get up in years like I have, is you've got a lot of those little defining moments, no matter what your career choices were, that kind of help you think through or were a point that gave you this, this inkling to make a decision or choose a path. But I was watching the Apollo moon landing with my mother, so I was in junior high school back then. And, and of course, there's a lot of people nowadays that weren't even alive. Yeah. Um, I was, and, and I was a young kid. And, and I was watching it with my mother, and my mother, after we watched it for a while, she just kind of looked over it, and she said, so what would you think of all that? And I said, well, I thought that was really really cool, really great. And she's, she said, well, would you ever be interested in doing something like that? Is that something that interests you? And I said, I said, I would love to do something. And it seems really neat. She said, but I, I said, but I don't think astronauts ever get any detentions. You know, they're just kind of like this perfect group of people. And, and of course, being, being a mother, as mothers say, and some of their more famous quotes that, that are universal is, well, if you, if you shape up and you work a little harder and you do what's right, Maybe it'll happen. Wow. That, I love that moment. And of course, I heard a little bit about that before this. And it really hit me. And I was thinking about it. And my question is, when your mom, mom said that to you, was there an immediate shift or was it like a progression? Because Did you like immediately start to say, well, I'm going to do better? Or did, did it kind of progress over time? It progressed. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of my my peer group that since they were little, they said, I'm going to be an astronaut when I grow up. And I want to be an astronaut when I grow up. And, and they, they geared their whole lives to do that. And, and that wasn't me. And it, and it probably wasn't at least half the audience of, or my peer group. Mine was, you know, you take a step at a time. You got to do, you got to do a lot of things to get there. There's a lot of steps along the way, a lot of gates to get through. And as you get through all of those, I call them gates, as you get through all of those events and accomplishments, the, not, the odds just keep narrowing down on you. So really you've got to figure out how you're going to get to the next one because you've got to work harder to get there. And, and that's really the bottom line of all of this. It's, for me, I took it one step at a time because – there's a lot of little moments like that. I went to flight school and, and I'm in jets, learning the, the basic jets. I hadn't started flying in the airplanes yet. And I'm watching from a bachelor's officer's quarters room, a BOQ room. I'm watching airplanes coming back in to land. And, and I'm thinking, I don't know if I can ever do that. That, that looks really hard. These mm -hmm. guys have formation and they fly fast and they're landing on aircraft carriers and they're shooting guns at targets and, you just take it a day at a time, but, but you stay focused on the end state. You stay focused on the goal. And I've always also been one that, that I set a lot of intermediate goals. And part of that is because I want a place to stop in case I want to stop. Because if you keep kind of going up to the top floor of the building and you're walking the stairs, it's a little harder than, than if you're just walking up one or two floors. But you get to choose which floor you get off. And which floor you get to live on. Yes. And, and, and I think that's, you know, the bottom line of all of that is no matter what you do, if you don't have a passion for it, you're going to have a hard time being happy for it. Oh, wow. Thank you for saying mm -hmm. that. Thank you for saying that. I, I'd like, well, definitely want to get more into that, but I want to grab this because I want people to understand like you had, you had, you were in detention, right? This was um, the walk on the moon landing, right? Yeah, attention was always my brother's fault. It was never mine. But uh, of course, 
Um, always somebody else has made me do it. But yes, and, and, and again, you know, part of the other lessons is you got to take ownership. So there's a point in time that I've got to say, if I want to do this, I have to do this. And, and it's not always the pleasant things you have to do to get to where you want to go. Sometimes you got to take some lumps along the way and you got to do some things that you'd rather not do, but, but they're part of the means to the end. Yeah, and I'm just wondering, was there a moment when you, after you, you had <clears throat> you read a lot and you had your mom say this thing to you? And, I, and so I, we were talking, that's a mother's, mother's intuition, right? They know what to say. And was there a moment after that where you thought, wow, there's a change here? Was there like any kind of moment where you thought, wow, this is starting to move? Or... So, you know, I want to say yes and no, but it happened a few years later. So I knew I wanted to fly airplanes, decided that I needed to get in the military to fly airplanes. So knowing I wanted to get in the military to fly airplanes, because that's where the real high tech stuff was, I had to do better in school. I had to get better grades in school. I needed to be able to get a scholarship to college, which was an ROTC scholarship, a military scholarship. So I needed to perform a lot better than what I was performing. And I did. And and. <clears throat> The motivation was, I really want to do this, and I can't do this if I don't do these other things first and, and get there along the way. And, and it's amazing sometimes, and I tell this especially to young folks, it's amazing and surprising how much you're going to learn after you already know everything. <laughs> and I was one of those. You, you knew everything, right? Yeah, there's points in times, probably like every other teenager in the world, or a young adult that I, that I got it. I know it. Yeah, I got it. Um, I know it. And then, and then you realize the longer you go, how much you never really knew anything. And, That's a great line, yeah. The more you learn about something, the more you realize whether it's medicine or space, the more you learn about it, the more you realize how much you don't know as opposed to what you do know. Yeah. I, I really want to hone in on something because I think it's important for the audience. And, and we want this to inspire you, by the way. <clears throat> I'm going to dig as much out of Andy as I can because of his, his story and his journey living an incredible life. And there's so much more to come. But uh, I think what you hit on is rather than trying to force yourself into shape, it's once you've got that passion, like once there's that progression, I want to be an aviator. It's like all of a sudden now the right behaviors start to show up. You start doing the right things rather than trying to force yourself to be something in the moment. And you, you touched on that passion, like, and, and it's, um, to me, it's an ongoing journey for all of us, like to really die onto that passion. And then what I found for me too, is like, once you know the passion, all of a sudden the right things start to take, start to happen really. Well, they do. And, and that passion is kind of what keeps you going when it doesn't go so well, because, you know, I look at what I've done and I think I really had kind of the opportunity to have three careers in my lifetime. So I had this career as an astronaut I had, but before that, I had a career as a Marine, a Marine officer, being a fighter pilot. And then I decided I wanted to go into business and see if I could learn something about that. So now I'm, I'm working in each place, no matter where I've had setbacks In each place I've had areas where I failed in each place I had what I thought were insurmountable odds of ever getting to where I wanted to go. And, and it's and it's how you kind of react to all of that. You know, just to tell myself for a second, my freshman year of college, like a lot of folks, was, was very distracting when I go away and I'm in my freshman year of college and I major in engineering. But my first midterm report, except for my ROTC classes, I had an F in everything on my first term midterm. That's incredible. I, so you, you had an F in every single class your freshman year at Villanova? I did. I did. That, midterm. 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 In your midterm, you had an F for all your mid. Wow. And so, of course, my, at the time, my parents saw that. And my father sat down with me like he did on a few occasions throughout my life. And, and he was never shy about doing that. And he said he wasn't really yelling or screaming. He was just, you know, kind of what are you doing? I mean, you're going to lose your scholarship. You're not going to get through school. You're not going to get an engineering degree. And you're, you're not going to accomplish this dream you want to have of being a pilot. And he was right. And so I had to take the ownership and I had to buckle up and or buckle down and, and say, all right, how do I get myself out of this mess that is my mess? 
in spite of all those distractions that I had, like college kids will have, how do I get through these distractions? Because there's always more fun things to do, especially when you first get away from home and get to make your own decisions about stuff. Yes. But how do I get at it? So, yeah, I had to, I had to figure out how I was going to ace every final exam in every course. Wow. I could come out with better than a 2-5 that first semester. Otherwise, you lose a scholarship. And then it just gets better from there because you learn the discipline, you learn the things, you learn the standards, you make your own standards of what you have to do, what you can do. Yeah. Yeah. You know, every place along the way, I mean, every one of these little career paths that I had, there's been, there's been times of, of major trial. There's been times of devastation. There's been times of um, the insurmountable odds of, of trying to overcome something. And, and you just got to kind of, push your way through it and, and pick yourself back up I, every place. And there's, there's times when I was flying that I felt like I'm not flying anymore. I felt like giving up. Like, there's some tragedies I had when I lost one of my best friends flying when I first had my very first car. Oh. And he made a mistake and, and flew into the water practicing air combat. And, and I just didn't think it was going to be for me anymore. I don't want to take the risk and, and, you know, he had a, a one-year-old and a, and a pregnant wife, and and his parents were visiting, and so it was, you know, a very tragic day. And here I lost my best friend, and wow. so maybe this isn't the right thing for me to do. Or pick yourself up and figure out that you've got to go move forward. So stay focused, and and there's people that help you along the way with all of that because you you really you don't accomplish anything by yourself. People, some people think they do, but they really don't. You really don't. You're so right. Yeah, I want I want to get more into that, but um, I got a surprise for you here. So, I hope you like surprises. Sure. All right, here we go. Hey, Uncle Andrew, uh, you've always been a great role model for me. Um, when I think of of you, I think of you know you saying over and over and drilled into my head is. If anyone could do it, it would be easy. And I can't tell you how many times I've played that over my head through the years, uh, taking on a new challenge or just trying to get through a difficult situation. So, um, you know, I'll, I, uh, I've enjoyed over the years since I've been a teenager, our workouts, our runs, our talks, our car rides, our bike rides, uh, so many things and it's just been incredible my uncle to see you do so many wonderful things, uh, flying, space, now as an entrepreneur, uh, and I know there's still more great things to come. So, uh, yeah, that, that's all that I have, and uh, if anybody could do it, it would be easy, right? Thanks. Wow. I thought that was a good place to interject that because what you just described in that moment was one of those moments. It is, and um, Freddie almost leaves me speechless. But, you know, it kind of really brings to, to head, um, as you go through all of these things, whether, whether they be trials and tribulations and challenges and accomplishments, you know, family is, um, you know, family is the greatest gift there is. And, and on one hand, the family is the, is the group that brings you back to reality, just in case you're thinking you're something special. So they can be a very humbling influence. Yeah. Um, my family, since they're not very shy about things, especially with my, my kids, since they're not shy about what's important. Um, it's more important to, to play a game of junior monopoly than it is to be rested after you just got back from a long space flight because you made a promise to get in the kids the center of the universe at the time. Yeah. But and the family is is the group that uh, the old adage when you have when you share sorrows they're half the sorrow and when you share joys they're twice the joy and that's the kind of stuff you get from family. Oh, I love that I'm gonna say that that so when you share sorrows with family they're half the sorrows and when you share joy it's du double the joy yeah it's beautiful. Wow, what a great, great thing. I want to just say hello to the audience here. Let, let Andy know that you're hearing this. Um, type in anything that you're feeling. What is this provoking? You got something to say? 
you're a family member, you're not allowed to comment, by the way. He told me that um, yeah. no family members are allowed to comment. <laughs> of course, they <laughs> like, never listen to anything I say anyhow. But... <laughs> yeah, so uh, Dennis saying, I'm loving this. Uh, how sweet. So okay. we have a couple of surprises. I want to prepare you. So we'll, we'll, we'll get to them in a bit. But you, you had this moment of... Um, with, with uh, the adversity that you dealt with as a marine aviator, and then you decide to, to move forward again and so on. I can only imagine, like, what that took to, um, to do that. Like, I'm just thinking of the, the, the emotions of, of that and then coming to a place and saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to press on anyway. Yeah. Um, again, life throws all those curveballs at you. And, you know, life is not supposed to be easy. It's not meant to be easy. It probably was never invented to be easy. It's, it's just one of those things that you're going to get uh, potholes in the road and you're going to get your speed bumps and you're going to have issues that you have to address. And it's, and I, again, back on family, family really helps you address all of that. But at the end of the day, there's two things that you've got to do yourself. One is you've got to take ownership, especially if it's your setback. Yeah. And, and then the second thing is, is you've got to take the risk or take the path forward and only you can do it. I, you can always regret things. And, and I hear a lot from folks. I wish I had done that. And I wish I had done that, but they didn't. So there you go. And, and, and then, and to the worst, the two sets of the two worst yeah. sentences that, that anybody can have that, that, you know, things that I don't like to entertain is the, I wish and the, I want. Because yeah. it doesn't mean anything. There's there's nothing to them. You know, I I wish I would win the lottery. It'd be great if I'd win the lottery, by the way. I could buy it. Yeah. But but you know, you want to hear I plan, I will. So wishing wants are just kind of empty. You've got to do more than that. And and that comes to you. If all of this, people will prop you up. There's a this is kind of a funny example, but I I told some of my kids sometimes that we watch when they're little kids, we watch you know, all the Disney movies. So there's Bambi. There's a point in Bambi that there's a big fire and, and the dad comes up to Bambi and he says, you got to get up. I can't pick you up. I'm not going to do it for you. Um, you got to get up and you got to move. And so that's kind of what you have to do. I can't imagine anybody, including us astronauts that don't have, depressive moments and don't have anxieties and and don't have the jitters you know we're just as human as everybody else and that kind of goes back to family if, if you ever want to get back to humanized um that's family and that's kids that's so that's, true i like that because we were talking about this before you said to me the, the two worst words in the english language are i wish which means like, I don't have control. I'm just a victim, right? Right. right. And, and of course, there's some things you don't have control over and there's some things you can't do and some things you have to deal with. There's people that are out there that are a whole lot braver than I will ever be. Yeah. And, there, and, there's, and face trials and tribulations that, that I, I can barely fathom. And I went to, and I went, I spoke to a, a kid's cancer center once, and that was one of those lessons for me of what those kids and what those parents really were having to go through and having to deal with. So, yeah, you know, sometimes there's, there's bigger challenges that some people get than others, but no matter what, you, you've got to figure out how you're going to deal with it. You got to, you got to own the situation. You got to own your roots. If you don't have the best roots in the world, then you don't have a good start with the family. You've got to own all of that and, and you've got to move forward from all of that. And nobody, that. Nobody is immune from all of that. And, and there are some God-given things that I was blessed with, health. You know, because to pass the astronaut physical, you got to be kind of normal in everything and not abnormal in anything you know, for all the things they can measure. And if there's a test known to humankind, a medical test, you know, they do it on us because they can. And we're a captive audience for them, so they will. So you, you make with the best of what it is you have. And what's with the hand yeah. that you're dealt. You know, it's not about complaining about the hand you're dealt. It's about playing with the hand. Yeah. I just want to honor uh, Cindy Marie here. Hello, she, Cindy. She said, uh, 
Uncle Andrew, your seventh period science class says they are fans. So and I say hi back, and she's one of the best science teachers I've ever known. And and one of those defining moments for me at a very young age and turned out to be in seventh grade was a science teacher. I didn't like science. And then I had a seventh grade teacher that really showed me different ways of thinking about science. And that's my sister that popped up. Yeah. She's on here too. I, I also want to point out to um, this is and I'm this is just coming up, but you, your dad. I mean, you were born to a, a World War II vet. I mean, I can only imagine. You know, my dad was in Vietnam, which was one experience, and your dad being a World War II vet. I can only imagine <clears throat> the experience and uh, what that bring brought to you growing up. You know, the Marine Corps. I've learned a lot from the Marine Corps, of course, because I spent 20 years in the Marine Corps. You know, but the Marine Corps, you know, prides itself on honor, courage, and commitment. And, and that's kind of the, the way that the Marine Corps tries to shape, especially in, in the leadership roles that you can have in the Marine Corps. That generation as a whole generation, you know, just highlighted all of those things. That was the generation that, you know, had tremendous courage, tremendous commitment. And it was a whole nation that was challenged in a, in a time yes. where everybody came together. You know, Vietnam, the individuals that are that are facing the bullets and getting shot at, they haven't changed a lot in the fact that they're as courageous and as honorable and as committed to their beliefs and their patriotism as anybody else. But it's really the rest of the world how that reacts. And that can make impacts on people as well because – I came into the military post Vietnam and it wasn't a very popular thing. Right. So you didn't get a lot of respect. You got a lot of teasing and a lot of jumping. And, and today it, it's, it's great because a lot of people have turned around that and people respect the people that risk anybody that risks something, anybody that risks themselves or someone to support someone and they'll risk themselves to support that person is a person that really ought to demand great respect from anybody, whether it be a fire fire or a medical care worker on the front line or policeman, military. And I think it's, I think it's a very special group of people that put something above themselves, put something above their, their personal nature and their personal well-being. And the good news is we have a lot of people in our nation that do that. Yeah. Yes, we do. And um, it's pretty incredible. And I, I didn't share this with you before, but I, I had an opportunity. I ran the uh, Marine Corps 50K um, in honor of my dad. And so I got to experience that firsthand because there's a mile that you run and you see all these fallen soldiers and not just soldiers, but police officers and people who, you know, they, they gave them lives in, in the line of duty. And it was really incredible, um, really incredible thing. And of course, the Marines, uh, an event that's just so, you know, you really get that feel down there in DC. So really incredible. Sure do. Now is that the Iwo Jima Memorial where that race ends? Was that yes. yes. Marathon? Yeah. Yes. Hello, Kristen. Yes, Kristen's here. And um, what we're going to do, I want to get deeper into the story. There's a lot more to come. We haven't even scratched the surface yet. Like I said, I'm going to do our best here. So say, say hello to Andy. Give him some love. He's, he's talking about some stories about early on, like growing up and, you know, not even really in the mindset of being an astronaut fully yet and all the incredible things that have happened along the way. So we're going to take a little break. This does have commercials, but they're, they're short. And I have another surprise for you. So I'm going to I'm going to play the surprise first, then I'm going to play the commercial so we can get, get a little bit of time. And then we'll come back on. We're going to learn a little bit more about the, the days as an aviator in the machine okay. before we get to the, uh, the next phase, which is well, I know everyone wants to hear about that. And I've already got, and I know you know this, but I've already gotten the, the, the silly questions, of course, right? Uh, okay. Lot of fun yeah. friends and some friends, of course, asking those questions. But we'll have some fun with that. So, um, all right, give me a minute. Here we go. Okay. Hey, Uncle Andrew. Growing up, you taught me that your family was always your greatest accomplishment. 
and we loved that you've always visited us every year and held true to your word to come to Pennsylvania. Uh, as a kid, outside of seeing you go to space three times, uh, I, I just loved the times that we would spend together with our family, going to Great Adventure, Aunt Val's pool, Uncle Matt's board games, and you just always made time for family. Um, you are really the glue that has always held our family together. Um, we wouldn't have cheese steaks and soft pretzels without you. So thank you for all that you've done. We love you very much and we're very proud of you. So here's Austin back with you. I'm just gonna share uh, something that we're, we have coming up this weekend and then we're gonna get right back to this incredible interview with Andrew Allen. Be right back. All right, everyone, I'm back. That's a summit that we're having this weekend. We just completed a book. It's called Flashpoint. Your turnaround story starts here. 12 incredible stories. So stay tuned if you want to join that. It's a free summit this weekend. Let's get back to this uh, interview with Andrew Allen. Okay. Andy, welcome back. Thank you. Kristen, I want to say thank you for putting this together because Kristen's the reason why this happened. And I had to. I just want to let everyone know that I had the honor of meeting you back in my corporate days and it always, it stuck with me. And when I got into this space, I thought, man, I really, I set the intention. I really wanted to reconnect with you. Uh, I didn't know how, but uh, here it is. We're here today. And so I, again, Kristen, thank you for making this happen. Any, anything you want to say? It's hard to follow Kristen. That's all I can say, you know, and Freddie, they're just, they're just gifted and wonderful people. She is, Kristen is amazing. I uh, had the opportunity to work with her for many years. So, yes. And she would always bring up your name, actually, before I met you. So I would always hear the stories. And I, I know you've had an um, incredible influence on her as well. So I want to dig back into your story about the, your time as a marine aviator. And I know there's a story that I'm, I really want people to hear because it stuck with me. And I, I just thought, <clears throat> wow. And I, and I really also want to dig into your psyche because – I know you say you push through and all these things, but I also understand that there's something going on with you and your, and your temperament and your way to approach situations. I know you've been trained, but I also believe there's other things that, that come, whether they're intuitive or, or whether they're genetic, but there's things there. And I would really like to see if I can tap into that. Are, are you willing to share that story about your time? Yeah, Sure. I don't know which story we're talking about, but yeah, whatever. I, uh, well, I know you have a lot of them. So, well, let me ask you this before I why don't you share with me one of your adverse times uh, as flying. I know we talked about one, but I'm going to leave it up to you. How's that? Well, I, I use the one that we talked about and the one that okay. folks know about, which is <clears throat> the lingo of, in the lingo of us in the flying business. It, it was a bird strike. But it, but it's me, um, you know, it, it's me on a low level training to go in to evade the enemy radar to come in under radar and to be able to deliver a weapons package, bombs or whatever the case may be. So we fly low to the ground, about four or five hundred feet, uh, and, and more time we'll be down there, you know, at the treetop level. But our rules try to keep us to about five hundred feet or so, and we're doing about. 540 knots, which is, you know, a little over 600 miles an hour. So we're, we're moving along pretty fast to the ground. And I've got a wingman with me, a, actually a young pilot. And, and in the blink of an eye, I saw a, a, a buzzard, a, a little vulture, a turkey buzzard. Mm. And 
it was in a nosedive and he and I were sharing, or she and I, whichever one, were sharing the same space for a split second. And it came and hit the airplane, uh, actually came through the glass, which is supposed to be bulletproof, but obviously it wasn't vulture-proof because the impact was so hard, even though it's a soft little bird that may only weigh 10, or 10 pounds or whatever they weigh, 15 pounds. Um, for a split second, it's enough of a cannonball to break through the glass. It came in and uh, did some damage to me, shoulder, throat, uh, eyes, lots of blood and guts, bones. And then uh, <clears throat> destroyed a lot of the inside of the cockpit. You know, and as you go through a moment like that, and, and part of the astronaut interview process is, is they like to drill into all of these things as well, because we have to spend time with, with some of the psychologists and psychiatrists that, that are part of that, because they're looking for the high stress situations that help define how people get through it all. You know, and in our world, <clears throat> you know, part of the goodness of what helps me get through stuff is, you know, between my ears, I tell folks I have a slow analog computer. So things just don't happen real fast. Or if they happen real fast, I don't react real fast. It's it's a, a left engine just blew up. Uh, okay, well, now what am I going to do? Do this, do that, break out the procedures. And so there's, you try, and, and we are trained, that there's not an only, you don't, you don't have an overreaction to all of that. You can't get emotional because emotion is what can kill you in that line of business. So you've got to stay in control. And of course, that's one of the things I preach a lot to a lot of people, no matter what, um, other than ownership, you got to stay in control. So if you're out at a college function and you're in a drinking game, you still got to stay in control. If you want to go out and have some fun with some friends and drive out, you got to stay in control. So you got to stay in control and you got to stay in control of your faculties and stay aware of what's going on. So I did all the appropriate things. You climb, <clears throat> you slow down. It hurt. I had a dislocated shoulder. I had a lot of uh, cuts and tears and the seat, the ejection seat got busted up a little bit. So we thought we might have to eject for a couple seconds. And fortunately we did it because the ejection seat had been damaged enough that it wouldn't have worked if we had tried it. Yeah. Uh, but the back seater who was in that plane was a very seasoned guy and was, he just watched and as long as the plane was in control then he was just going to let it go and then the first few seconds as you go through a, a moment like that and it probably happens with people that have car accidents the first reaction sometimes is I must be dreaming this this can't really be real and then however long it takes and maybe it's milliseconds or seconds. And then when the pain sets in, you feel like, well, yeah, maybe this is real and I've got to do all the right things. So, and as you try to assess the situation, I thought I had lost an eye because there's a lot of, um, wow. lack of a better word, skin and guts and things hanging out of my eye, which are from the bird and not from me. But as I'm peeling them out, because there's a little bit of a mirror that's half of a mirror left that we used to use to look behind the airplane, mostly for bad guys or behind us if we can and everything's covered in blood, and I can't talk because my voice box was kind of crushed or damaged or, or shocked, whatever it was, but I couldn't talk on the radios. Wow. And I'm doing hand signals with the guy in the back. And, and, and again, you make decisions. And what are the decisions? Do I object or do I not object? And am I going to bleed to death or am I not going to bleed to death? So, wow. well, I watched the movie. It was MASH, and, and if it was an aorta, it should be spurting out, but it's not. It's starting to dry out, so I must be... It must be okay. Uh, so you control the situation, you control the airplane, and then you figure out your next step plans. Okay, well, here's a setback. Now what am I going to do about it? There's an airfield right over here that's an Air Force airfield. And then, yeah, I go in there and I take good care of me, but I want to go home. And I, and I want to go to a place that I know I can't see very well. I'm really limited vision to almost one eye at that point. Wow. Between all the, the debris and the blood that was inside the cockpit, I really can't see very well outside the cockpit. Wow. So landmarks will help me land the airplane because I do want to land the airplane and not eject. And so I decided to go back to the home station. So that's about an extra 20 minutes we had to do all this. But it gave me time to assess and it gave me time to think about things. And it gave me time to actually burn down some fuel because we were very heavy. And it gave people on the ground time to react when I got there. So you just go through the steps. And... You can't get emotional about it because 
if you do, then nobody else is going to land the airplane for you. Uh, there's no stick in the back seat. So you've got to get through this crisis. And if you don't, then you're going to die. So in this case, it's kind of simple because if you don't do this, you're going to die. And so you do it. And I have to do this. So I've got to do all the right things. And my training and thought processes all worked out well. And you come in, you land the airplane. And, and then they whisk you off to the little hospital and they stitch you up and clean you up and take bone fragments out of you. And, and then just like, and in, in our system, whenever there's an accident or some kind of an event, the word gets out pretty quickly because we call it the wives network, but everybody will hear something. And then as they hear something, people start calling people. Is your husband home? Is he here? Who's not here? Who could it be? You know, where is everybody? Is everybody accounted for? So sometimes they hear about it before everybody ever tells them officially because they just have a really good network of trying to figure all of that out. Um, so yeah. again, it's just one of those events and you, and you, and you get through it and uh, you move on. And then, wow. And there was also an event that after it was all said and done, um, that was one of those times, and there was a couple of them, that was one of those times I wasn't sure that I wanted to go back and fly again. And one of the old seasoned Marine pilots sat down next to me when I was kind of sitting on the step and said, hey, we're not going to make you go fly, um, but the sooner you do and the sooner you get back on the plane, you know, the quicker you're going to recover from all of this. You, know, you just had this event that's going to kind of shock you for a while, but you got to make a decision. Your decision is to quit. Wow. Um, do something different or get back into it and, and go forward to your next adventure, whatever. Wow. There. So, I mean, there's things that in the world of aviation, there's, there's a lot of pilots, especially in that vintage of airplane, the F4 Phantom that make mistakes and mistakes can be fatal in that line of business. Yeah. Wow. And it's a very unforgiving kind of an airplane. And then there's also things that happen that aren't personal mistakes. They're kind of God given challenges. You know, I, I call them God given challenges because um, nothing was planned that way. It just happened and it happened. Nobody was in control that it was going to happen and, and it just happened. And so you just got to deal with just happened. Yeah. And I, well, first of all, so those are, a turkey buzzard is a very large bird. <laughs> if you don't know, it's a very large bird. And this protrudes through the windshield and it just basically engulfs you. And now you're, and I, as I'm you again, I know I've heard this. I can only imagine like when you, when you go back and look at it and, and you thought through and you went through like run the tapes again, you, you might've thought, wow, if I would have done that, it could have been fatal. If I would have done that, it, it could have been fatal. And you just happened to play the right note or make the right decisions. And in, in hindsight, it was the right, it was the right decision. And I also, I think it's valuable for us to hear what you said. You said you run like an old analog computer, <laughs> but it's interesting because a lot of times we feel like we have to rush into that first action and in this situation that would have been a mistake so you the way you were wired was you 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 gave yourself a moment to process you do and and, and there's been other cases of other things that i have done that i've had those kinds of setbacks even though they weren't as prolonged as that one was and, and you go into as you think through and assess and decide how you're going to work forward in all of this you you go to plan a and then all of a sudden, plan A doesn't work. So you go to plan B. And then you go to plan C. And then plan D. And you just keep on going to the next plan, either until you finally either have to eject out of the airplane or you die. I mean, so you, you just don't stop. You just don't give up saying, this isn't going to work. Now what am I going to do? I just got to write it out. And then you just, you just say, no, I got to do something else. Okay, that can work. I got to do something else. So you, just, you, just keep, you just keep at it. And you did. And you're here. And what an amazing story. Yeah. What an amazing story. We, we have about 11, 11 or 12, maybe 20 minutes left. And I want to get to the other part because I could talk to you all day just about that alone. Okay. But um, your time here with the Marines is, is uh, well, actually, you learn about NASA, take an application, I think, at that point, 
And then you put an application and I'd love for you to talk about this because when I heard, you know, how this played out for you as well, it's really incredible. And it really is. And um, that's another one of those things. Each, each gate, as I call them gates, but they're all steps, each step. And that's kind of why I, I never had quite the confidence to say, I'm going to go from step one to step 82 and I'm going to make it all the way. I said, I'm going to go step one to step two. And if step two works, I'll think about step three and see if I get, and that's kind of the way it went. So as I, you know, the first thing in flight school, I say, okay, of all the things I want to do, I want to be a fighter pilot. Well, there's only going to be about 20 or 30% of all the folks that get through the school that are going to get the grades to get into the fighter pilot world. So you get in the fighter pilot world and they said, okay, well now, I want to be one of the top guns and go to top gun school. Only about 10 or 20% of all those fighter pilots go to top gun and, and get into top gun. And then you say, okay, well now I'm going to apply to test pilot school. If I want to apply to test pilot school, I need to do that because that's not picks test pilots. If you're going to be a pilot, not a mission specialist. Well, about 4% get selected as test pilots that apply as test pilots with all those other things behind you. So each time the odds get narrower and narrower, but each time there was a step. And I went to test pilot school and I'm in test pilot school and, you know, it's the haven of, of test pilots and NASA comes out and they say, Hey, let's look for a new astronaut class after the challenger accident. And I was still a student at test pilot school and the senior test pilot and the commanding officer of the school came in and said, Hey, all you young guys, we're not going to endorse any of you. Don't even bother applying. They never pick astronauts when they're in test pilot school. They never pick anybody on their first try. We have too many people that are applying. Wow. Doors all these people that are just so much more people don't even bother trying it. And if you do try, we're not going to endorse you. Wow. Disappointing because I didn't know when the next chance would happen. And so like, like a lot of us pilots do, we, we go commiserate and do boy bonding at happy hours on, on Fridays with all the other pilot types out there and the senior Marine who was in charge of all the Marines that were there at the Tuxent River, Maryland, he came up to me and said, are you going to apply? And I said, no, I was told not to apply and I don't stand a chance. What I was told. And plus I didn't think I stood a chance. And again, he's like, well, so what, you know, I'll endorse you. I'll, I'll put your reference in. Go ahead and apply. And, and if nothing else, you're going to learn something because if you don't get picked your first time, you'll have learned something which you had to do help wow. you the second time. So I did. And, and it just kind of worked out that two people from Patuxent River, Maryland, got picked for the astronaut selection that year, and I was one of them. So, it, again, it's kind of beating the odds. But, uh, you know, a lot of that along the way is, is because you have mentors. And it kind of goes back to – um, you don't do any of this by yourself. You, of course, yes. You have the support of the people that care and love you. Uh, will go through all these things with you, but at the same time, you have the people that there's something about you that they want to help. And they want to teach. So, yeah, you see somebody that that cares about what they do and and has respect of what they do and all the others that are in that world and they make the efforts, then these, that's going to attract the people that are going to help you. They're going to say, let me help this person because I think, I think this person might have something there and, and you can't do it without, without those mentors. And there's a lot of special mentors in my life. And, and those people are the ones that help you get along or continue to keep you encouraged when you get very discouraged because yes, it comes a lot easier than encouragement. Yes, and I'm I'm thinking to myself, what if that conversation never happened? But that right. you know, because a mentor a lot of times can see something in you that you may not be in touch with as well, and, and being able to say, "Hey, go for it." And my goodness, I mean, that's wow, that's incredible. Can you share the numbers? Because I, I think you said there was like ten thousand applicants to start with. So I think that year there is. 10 or 12,000 applications, if I remember right, for mission specialists and pilot. And if you're in the military, they ended up picking 15 people that year. If you're in the military, each of the military services will have their own um, selection board. So in the Marine Corps, there was probably 1,500 or more Marines that were qualified that applied. 
And then the Marine Corps did a selection board. They came out with 21 Marines, and they sent those 21 names to NASA and said, hey, here's 21 guys for you to look at. Then you do the, the interview processes that NASA has. They'll do interviews of, of uh, 20 people at a time, 20 candidates at a time. And the, week, the interview is a week-long interview. Most of it is medical testing or medical data collection, but there's a few different psychiatric exams. You, I call them exams. The psychiatrists don't call them exams, but I call them exams. And would you rather hit your thumb with a hammer or throw up on a crowded bus? Pick one. You know, you pick one. That'll tell us something about you. <laughs> so, and then there's all the, the two or three, there's two, three or four hour discussions with the psychologists or psychiatrists to kind of dig in. And there's also a couple of social events that are pretty important during that week uh, just to see how you can work in front of people. But so the, so the Marines, so NASA decided to interview six Marines out of that Marine group. And at the end of all that, they selected one. So I was the, I was uh, the token Marine for that year. And Say that again. It cut out. You were the what? I was the token Marine for that year, as I call it. You know, they, token Marine. So token 10 to 12,000, 10 to 12,000 applicants down to about 2,000 Marines. Well, yeah. there's, there's about 12,000 applicants in total that NASA got. So the Marine Corps had 1,500, but NASA only got 21 of the Marines. The Air Force does the same thing. Navy does the same thing. Oh, okay. So out of about 10 or 12,000, they interview 120. So they find the people to interview, which is a very hard process. And then out of that, 120 that they interviewed, they selected 15 that year. You know, and again, part of it is any one of the people that get interviewed are more than qualified to be there. Yeah. For whatever reason, it wasn't their turn. Or, and, I, and I never really know what the real secret sauce was. And, and I've told people before that for the people that put in my references, sometimes the references are about not who you worked for or put in a good word for you, but who worked for you mm. that would put in a good word for you? Because because sometimes it's like monkeys in a tree. The monkeys below you don't always see you turning down, turning around and having a happy, smiling face. They see the wrong end of you and <laughs> like that all the time. <laughs> then, good. then they'll remember that. And when they get asked what you like, they said, I don't know. I never saw his face. Mm. You know, Backside because he never turned around to give me a helping hand. He never turned around to help me out. Or she. Right. And, and again, so as you go through that, they learn a lot about about people in that process, and it, it's kind of a good process. It's not a perfect process, but it's a pretty good process. And <clears throat> not everybody's going to get picked, and and those that don't get picked, that you know, they have their decisions of trying again or not trying again. You can't get everything you want. So there's times that you just have to accept what you have. Yeah. Well, I, I got another surprise for you. And oh boy. We're going to be into the closing sequence here. But um, well, the last two have brought tears to my eyes. So I don't know what you got in for well, this. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well you know what? I, I wanted to make it special for you because I appreciate you coming on here. And, uh, you're very welcome. And, you. and I know you're humble. And, and Kristen, <laughs> Kristen's saying you're so humble. So. <laughs> But um, Thanks, Chris. I, I think that the stories that you share are so inspiring and I think people need to hear them. And, I, and before I share this um, surprise for you, I just want people to think about that in your journey. You, you, if I can, I wonder if I can get there, if I can get there, then. what? And I think that approach kept you humble and kept you moving. Not like I'm going to get to, I mean, and I know it's in the back of your mind, like you're thinking of it, but you're, you're bringing yourself. If I can just get there. And then you're dealing with those moments when, ah, it's, I'm going to quit. But then you step. And there's that constant dance, if you will. And, and I just love how you just kept stepping through the mentorship, through the people, through your own innate fortitude. You just kept stepping. So we'll, okay. Let's, let's share this and uh, we'll come right back. Okay. Hello, I'm Candy. I am Andrew's youngest sister. Uh, could be where he thinks I was uh, the younger sister who was the itch, or I could think he was the older brother who was an itch when we were growing up. Um, so many wonderful memories. And uh, one thing I do remember is when we would come home from school, 
my brother and Janet, my sister, and I would watch Batman and, and My Favorite Martian and Dark Shadows, and it was a wonderful time in our lives eating Chips Ahoy, Chips Ahoy cookies and milk. So um, probably one of the most exciting things for me, uh, even before Andrew became an astronaut, was he was a fighter pilot in the Marine Corps. So uh, he flew uh, many different aircraft, he and the F-4s, but then he uh, advanced on to F-18s, the Hornet, which is an ultimate ride. I wish I was, well, I wish I could say that, but I really can't because I never was on it. But we used to uh, pick him up at Willow Grove Naval Base when he would come home to visit us in, um, in his F-18. And then when he became an astronaut, he flew into Willow Grove on the little T-38 and would do some uh, naval, uh, some air shows. And it was a lot of fun, very, very exciting for me to pick him up and take him back and, and watch him take off. And he would tip his wing to, to give us a goodbye. And then of course, Andrew became an astronaut and the whole family felt so thrilled. Uh, watching him launch three times was just an incredible, incredible experience for us. Can't even imagine what it was like for him, but he will, I'm sure he will tell you. And as I had always said to him, and I think he has passed this on to his children, is that Andrew, the sky is not the limit. I love you and I'm very, very proud of you for everything that you've ever done in your life. Bye. This is Austin. This is Flashpoint. Your turnaround story starts here. I've been chatting with Andrew Allen, former uh, NASA astronaut, three-time space veteran, and um, I'm humbled to be uh, conducting this interview. And we're getting into the closing sequence. We have a couple minutes left, so I'm going to bring bring Andy back on uh, for some final statements. But this is streaming live on Amazon, Apple. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be up on the podcast. But if you're listening, I want to encourage you to type a question in because there's so much more to cover. But type a question in a comment so we can always get back to you with that. All right, Andy, I'm going to bring you back on here. And I Okay. Love you too, Ken. Very nice. We got a couple, we got about a minute or so. The floor is yours. So I want to give you the final words here and we're going to close this out. And I, I just thank you again for being here. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, we've talked about a lot of things and, um, and again, I, you know, I've never felt that, um, <laughs> You know, when they, when they when my references would talk about me in the astronaut office, probably in the astronaut selection process, and I, and I tell this to people, they would have probably not said he's the smartest person I've ever met on the planet. I can't imagine anybody would ever say that, one, because I'm not. And they would say he's smart, but they wouldn't say he was, like, uniquely the smartest person we've ever met. And they wouldn't say that he's the greatest, most gifted aviator that's ever touch the control stick in an airplane and flew an airplane because because I'm not. Am I competitive? Yeah. Am I good? Yeah. But I think what they would have always said and what I would imagine all of them would have said is is like is that I am you know very dependable. I'm really a hard worker and I really want to make sure that I do the things right that people count on me to do and, and not fail people or not fail myself. So I think what it goes back to is again something my father would always tell us is you know, what you want to do is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. So it's all about the level of effort that you're going to put into that. Yeah. You know, as far as the family stuff goes, again, I, I can't think of a greater gift than, than kind of a strong family. It doesn't come without work and you got to work on it, but it's one of those things that will endure all your trials, all your tribulations. And it's so very important to do that. And from a parent's perspective, it's important to try to give your kids the right standards and disciplines and give them that good starting point in life. So it's up to them on whether they do well with it or not do well with it. And they've got to take ownership for that. And you want to be proud of them. So it's something that really a parent should work hard to do. But most importantly, I think is for me is you want your, your kids to be proud of you. So a lot of decisions I've made over time have been strictly about, you know, is this the right decision to do this? And so, you know, you want them, uh, 
you want you want your children to be proud of what you're up to, what you do, and, and understand that you're just a human like everybody else is just a human. But give it a go. And again, there's there's no more humbling experience that can bring anybody back down to reality than the kids. Isn't that the truth? I think that's a great way to, to close this. I wish I had more time. Maybe we can do it again. But, you know, returning to the to the family unit now more than ever is probably a, a great thing. I couldn't think of anything better out of all the great things we've discussed. Just being able to return to that family unit, restore it, whatever you got to do. Um, that's our, our greatest, greatest source of strength. Okay. Well, thank you for the surprises. Um, and thank you for this event. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm so glad you joined us today for Flashpoint. Your turnaround story starts here. This playback will be continuing, so feel free to comment, ask questions, share, whatever. We, we, we just ran out of time, so maybe we'll do it again. Thank you so much, Andy. I appreciate you. Bye for now, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.